<laughs> Hallelujah. She's never met a man. Come on. Amen. But she's holding in her hands the baby. Yes. Hallelujah. That God promised Come on. to the world. Amen. Amen. Praise my, 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 my. How could Praise it be? Thank you, Jesus. How could it be? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Life, health, and strength. Hallelujah. World lost and undone without any hope. Praise the Lord. Today has hope. How could it be? Hallelujah. Jail, the babe is now a lamb. Or in a Muslim land. How could it be? Yes, Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise Go with me this morning to Hebrews, the second chapter. Hebrews, the second chapter. And we read this scripture the last time we preached. Come on. Hallelujah. This is the direction that the Holy Spirit took me again. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Hebrews, the second chapter. Did I say the second chapter? I think so. Yeah. Hebrews, the second chapter, the first verse. The Bible says, Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. The Apostle Paul talking about the gospel. The Apostle Paul was very protective of the message that he preached. Amen. So much and so sure of its trueness and the truth and the truthfulness of it. Amen. So assured of that mm -hmm. that he would say, if an angel from heaven comes and preaches you anything else, come on. Let him be cursed. Yes. Yeah. If another preacher comes, and because see they had those then too. Yeah. They had those yeah. then too. The Apostle Paul, a lot of his writing. To the churches dealt with false doctrine. Yes. Amen. And it dealt with false teachers that were coming into the church and teaching things that were not right. So the Apostle Paul wanted to make it clear about the message that he preached, the message of the cross and the only means of salvation and growing up in God and exactly what sin would do to you. Amen. Come on. His message, he wanted to make sure that they knew and he wanted to make it clear of the confidence he had in that which he preached. He said, if another minister comes, and preaches to you another gospel right. than this. Let him be cursed. True. If an angel from heaven comes and preaches something different, let him be cursed. If I change my mind somewhere along the way and I come and preach you something different, on, let me be accursed as well. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. That's how, that's how uh, con convinced he was. That's how persuaded he was of the message that he preached and the calling that God had put on yeah. his life. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Amen. So much so that he went to, he took uh, extreme steps to make sure. Of course, it still happens. It happens today. Come on. But he wanted to make sure their eyes were never on him. All right. But that they were on the message, the, the Christ that he preached. Amen. The only time he tells them to follow him is to follow him as long as he keeps following Christ. Amen. Amen. The minute that I no longer follow Christ, stop following me. Amen. Because I've done got off the right path. Right. So the Apostle Paul in his writings here says we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard. Guard the things. Be, be a, a guardian over that which has been delivered to us. Amen? Amen? Lest at any time, lest at any time we should let them slip. And I told you the last time yeah. that this carries the idea of a ring slipping from one's finger. Oh. And regrettably the church that we presently have today has left the message of the Bible. Amen? Mm -hmm. They have allowed the message of the Bible to slip. And as a result, the church of today, listen to me, the church of today hardly knows where it's been, where it is, where it's going, or what is right and what is wrong. The yeah, lines yeah. between right and wrong have become so blurred that anything goes today and everything's all right. And you can fill a building preaching that kind of thing. Amen? Yeah. Brother Sleece was talking about all the different faiths coming together and worshiping in one place. And you can do that. You can have that. As long you, The Muslims will come in and they'll sit down and worship with you. As long as you don't preach Jesus is the only way and all other ways lead to hell. Amen. Because once you begin preaching that, that's going to offend some people. Some people's going to leave. That's why we do not see the mega, churches, the mega church pastors of our day preaching that there. When they are cornered and asked if Jesus is indeed the only way, they sidestep quicker than a hillbilly in a, in a barn dance. Amen. Come on. They get around that the best way they can. Mm -hmm. Because when you preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified yep. is the only means of salvation, it will offend All so. right. You can have homosexuals that come into your church every Sunday right. and feel fine about their lifestyle Amen. and worship right along beside of you. 
because you never preach against homosexuality. Right. Amen? True. We'll go a step farther than that. You can have adulterers and fornicators. Amen? Right. People shacking up together, living together, not in wedlock. True. And they'll come to church and they'll take they'll they'll take points of leadership. Right. You will appoint them to be your youth leaders. You will appoint them to be your Sunday school teachers. Oh. And they will never, on the, on the platform playing your music, oh. and they will never be convicted or offended because you never preach against adultery and fornication and shacking up. Amen? Yeah. Oh. As long as you don't ever preach anything yeah. except for Dr. Feelgood's yeah. message. Amen? Amen. Everybody's going to come. Everybody's yeah. going to feel good. Yeah. They're going to be the same as they were when they came when they leave, though. Right. Because the gospel will offend. Exactly. The apostle Paul spoke to him one time and he said, Do you now hate me? This is not a quote, but do you hate me? Or are you angry with me? Because I tell you the truth. Amen. He says, Take heed. Guard those things which have been delivered to you. Come on. Listen to what he says in verse two, in verse two. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast. And every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, meaning that there was just and there was judgment. A third of the angels were kicked out of heaven. Amen? Mm -hmm. If the angels were not good enough to escape judgment for their sin, we are certainly not good enough today to escape judgment for our sin. Amen? Amen. That's not something you will hear in, hear in very many churches today, but it's the truth anyway. And then he makes this statement, and this is what we really talked about last time. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? I want to ask you these questions today. How shall we escape if we neglect the message of this book? How shall they escape if we neglect to preach the message of this book? How shall they know the truth that will set them free? Amen. Unless there is a preacher proclaiming. Amen. Unless there is Christians proclaiming. Amen. Unless there are lay members proclaiming. Sunday school teachers, song leaders, people in the pew from the top to the bottom, everybody in between. Unless we are proclaiming the truth of the Word of God. How shall they know that truth? Come on. Preach. Unless that truth is proclaimed. Come on, preach to us. So how shall we escape if we neglect to take heed to the message of this book? How shall we escape, preachers? If we neglect to preach it, and how shall they escape? All right. If we neglect to preach them the truth. Romans 10, beginning in the 13th verse. The book of Romans, the 13th verse of chapter 10. The Apostle Paul says, For, whoms, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? Now listen to me. How shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Think about that. Think about what it says in Hebrews 2 and 3 whenever He said, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Think about what He says here whenever He says, How shall they hear without a preacher? God chose the foolishness of preaching according to 1 Corinthians 1 and 22. He chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You are called today to be a minister of the gospel. Come on. Some are called to do it from behind the pulpit. All of us are called to do it in our everyday life. Amen. Amen. Yes. God never intended for you to come in on Sunday morning and be religious and lift Him up and thank Him and be a great Christian and then to leave your experience or your relationship with God inside the doors and pick it up again whenever you come back to church. God intends for you to be the light Amen. of the world. Yes. To show forth your good works yes. so that they will glorify your Father. Not you, but they will glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. They will see in you what God has in store for them if they will turn to Him. Amen? How shall they hear without a preacher? Yeah. How shall those in the dark find their way home without a light of some sort to lead them? Amen? 
That's what we should be. The Bible says a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Amen? Let your light so shine before men. That's your job. That's your job. That's your job. That's my job. That's the church's job today. Not to make the world feel better. Not to become friends with the world. The Bible says being a friend to the world is makes you an enemy of God. Yeah. I didn't preach it. That's what the book says. I didn't, I didn't write it. That's what the book says. I'm Amen. preaching it. But I didn't write it. That's what the book says. Amen. If you are a friend to the world, you're an enemy of God. Right. Because the world is enmity with God today. Yes. A carnal man is enmity with God today. True. It's time that I'm not talking about treating the world bad. But if you think that you can still look like, act like, talk like, and fellowship with the world and win the world, you're going to be in for a rude awakening. Because they don't want what you got. They already got it. You need to make them hungry for something that they don't have. True. And you'll never do that by acting just like what they've already got. Exactly. Amen. You may be a friend of theirs, but the Bible says to be a friend with the world is to be an enemy of God. Amen. God chose the foolishness of preaching. Yes. He must have been talking about me. He chose the foolishness of preaching to save the lost. And how shall they hear without a preacher? You see today, Brother Dave, we don't need more politicians. Amen. We don't need more books. Right. We don't need more churches. What we need is some more spirit-filled preachers. preachers. We got enough movie stars, amen, that took the platform this morning in their $5,000 suit, amen, to entertain the crowd. We've got enough movie stars. We need some old-fashioned preachers who will preach hell so hot that you can feel the heat. We need some old-fashioned preachers that will preach a heaven. There's a heaven to gain, yes, and a hell to shun. We need some old-fashioned preachers that are preaching so hard you will feel the convicting power of God grip you and you will repent because you're so miserable if you don't. Come on, brother Billy. We need some old-fashioned preachers. Amen. Hallelujah. Give me, give me an old-fashioned preacher anytime Amen. over what we've got today. Right. Amen. Somebody that's been alone with God. Right. Somebody that's been on their face seeking God. Somebody who ain't uh, don't care if their hairdo didn't come from the beauty parlor. Somebody don't care that their clothes came off the Goodwill rack than they did if they came off the racks there in J.C. Penney's and different places. Someone who doesn't care about all of that but cares about your soul. Amen. That cares enough for you to tell you the truth. Right. Amen. Sermons that bring old-fashioned conviction. Yes. But sadly today, the world, and I'm, begin, I'm beginning to think and understand that it's more the church than it is the world that wants to shut preachers up. All right. You see, they don't want old-fashioned preachers. They don't want preachers who preach the uncompromised Word of God. You know what they want? They want a motivational speaker. They want doctor feel good. Yeah. Yeah. They want somebody to make them feel good about their flesh. Now, don't get me wrong. I want you to feel encouraged. I want you to feel joy. I want you to feel hope. But if you're on your way to hell, I want you to feel bad. Amen. Amen. Right. If you are worshiping another god, I want you to feel bad. Amen. If you are living an ungodly lifestyle that will lead to destruction, I want you to feel bad today. I don't want you to say that. Well, you know what? I'm a Muslim. I go down there at that little church next to the post office and I worship with them and I'm just fine. I don't want you to say, say that. Mm. If you're a Muslim and you come in here and hear me preach, I want you to leave out here and say, well, I never in my life. I ain't never going back to that place. I want to make you mad. Amen. I want to stir you up enough to inspect what you believe. Yes. Amen. I want to get you stirred up enough to inspect what you believe. Amen. To cry, oh God, if I'm wrong, show me. Yeah. Not walk out saying, well, I must be right. He didn't say nothing about this other... Yeah. I don't want to be this come by y'all community thing where every faith and every belief comes in and we all worship and we all go out and go on to our, to our, to our separate gods that we worship. Come on. Christianity cannot have fellowship with other religions. Yes. Not true Christianity. Right. Because real biblical Christianity, the message of the gospel is that there is one way and that is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And any other means of salvation, any other faith, any other doctrine, any other false teaching is exactly oh, that. Amen. The doctrine of devils and false teachings. An enemy of the oh, cross. Oh, but the world wants doctor, the church wants doctor feel good. Uh -huh. 
You see Satan trying to starve the preachers out that are actually preaching the truth. Right? Yeah. He'll talk to you and he'll convince you to send your money to that big mega church. Amen. Surely they're doing more for God than this other preacher because they've got 40,000 people in their church every Sunday. Yeah. Surely they're doing more for God than that little hole in the wall over there on 216 Hill Street. So Satan will try to starve the preachers out. He'll get you to send your money to the big mega church, to the group that never judges, the group that never mentions hell, the group that never mentions sin, the, the group that looks like the world and sounds like the world. And they're banned this morning. You couldn't tell the difference between them and Def Leppard, amen, and some of the other rock groups. You couldn't tell if they were worshiping God or if they were having a rock concert. That's where he wants you to send your money because he wants to starve us preachers out that are still oh, preaching the truth. Yeah. Amen. Oh, but we got news for the devil this morning, amen? Good preaching. You keep your money. Keep on plowing. And if God has to, He'll use the cousin of a buzzard to bring something to eat for the man of God. Amen. Right. If God has to, He'll send the man of God to a little widow woman that has an empty barrel and an empty cruise. Amen. And He'll fill them up to sustain the man of God and those that will bless Him. Come on, Amen. Yes, sir. Now before you turn me off, listen to this. Most of you out there would be better off if you took your money yeah. and flushed it down the toilet than to give where you've been given. Can I say that again this morning? Amen. Most of you out there, if you hadn't turned me off yet, listen, because you're probably thinking, wait a minute, I can't believe he said that. Most of you out there would be better off if you took your money and flushed it down the toilet than to give where you've been given. Buying their best sellers, buying their holy water, buying their holy oil, buying their holy prayer shawls. You'd be better off if you took your money into the can and flushed it down the pot, amen, than you are sowing seed into those damnable doctrines and enemies of the cross today. Come on, brother Billy. You'd be better off preach. flushing your money. Come on, preach. Amen. Because it's not accomplishing anything. As a matter of fact, it's doing more harm than good. That's right. Amen. Right. You'd be better off if you went and bought you a swimming pool of the bass boat. Amen. Yeah. Than you would be to write out your yeah. check to the mega church pastor this yeah. morning. Most of them, not all of them, most of them this morning, you'd be better off to flush your money than you would to be giving it to them people. Amen. Amen. You'd accomplish more to buy your pool table. And build you a recreation room next to your house there. Build onto your house and build your big recreation room. Amen. Do just as much good. Yeah. Do just as much good. Yeah. Be better. Be better, Brother Lee said. Absolutely. Amen. Be better and cut them off. You see, because most big name preachers, and not all of them, there are some, there are some preachers that are still preaching the truth. Amen. I was glad this week to hear John Hagee, who I don't agree with on everything. Yeah. Some of his teaching on prophecy in Israel, yeah. I don't find that to be right or lined up with the Word of God. But this week I was blessed to flip the channel like Brother Sleeve is talking about. And there was John Hagee. And he made this statement in a roundabout way. I can't quote exactly, but he said, If you do not accept Jesus Christ and put your faith in Him as Lord and Savior, you will not go to heaven. Amen. Amen. No compromising yeah. in that message. Amen. True. I was blessed. So there are still some preachers preaching the truth. Absolutely. But there are way more out there. See, that's a rare thing for me to find that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. That's a rare thing because yeah. most of the time you got Mike Murdoch and the boys telling you how to get rich. Right. Amen. Most of the time you got the word of faith preachers telling you that you have enough creative power in your voice to speak things into existence, and that's baloney. Amen. Most of the time you find feel good. Be the best you you can be. Yeah. Have the best life now. Yeah. Do all of those things. And all of the most of the big preachers that you hear today, their message is an enemy on, of the brother. cross. That's right. on, brother, no more sermons with convicting power of the Holy Ghost on them. True. Only feel good. No mention of hell. No mention of sin. No exactly. warning of the enemy. Exactly. And I told you this before, but I don't know if you call it or the significance of the statement. I have, I've talked to people like this, so I know this happens. When they do, when the people in the pew do feel some semblance of conviction, the preacher preaches it right out of them. All right. Well, you don't need to feel bad. Uh -huh. You know what that is, don't you? 
That's the devil. Trying to make you feel bad about the sin you're living in. Yeah. The devil don't want you to feel bad about the sin you're living in. The devil wants you to feel good right on into hell. Amen? Mm -hmm. So even if they do feel some semblance of conviction, yeah. the pastors say we need to have some, we need to have a counseling meeting. Yeah. Amen? Mm -hmm. We need to talk. Yeah. Brother Donnie Swaggart, I think it was Brother Donnie Swaggart, one of the preachers on SBM, told the story about a, a man and a woman. And the man, that was an email they received from this man and woman. They were alcoholics. They went partying every night, every Friday, Saturday night, whatever the case may be. But when they came, when they came to Jesus, when they got saved, they gave up drinking. They gave up the partying. They gave up that life. They were more or less social alcoholics. They moved and they joined this big church and they were all going to have a fellowship Friday or something like that. And they went over to their to the place where it was being held and they weren't there very long until this couple said that they began to pass out some drinks. Alcohol. And they said they couldn't believe it. They said to one another, we're going to have to talk to the pastor about this. He, he's got to know about this. Yeah. Don't want to start no trouble, but he needs to know that half his church over here getting drunk. Yeah. So they call for a meeting with the pastor and they go to his office and they say, Pastor, we don't want, we want to be tail bearers, but we want to tell you about these fellowship we went to the other night. said, they all were drinking. And the pastor said, oh, I need to counsel you on that. That's okay. As long as you don't get drunk, you can still drink. So the pastor convinces them that it's all right. And they said, it's not long to their back being the alcoholics they were once before, before they ever got saved. So finally, Holy Ghost convinced he got on so bad they had to leave that church and find another. They quit drinking again. Now they're living for the Lord. But my point of the story is this. They went to the pastor for some spiritual leading. And that's where the blame lays for most of what I'm going to talk about today is in the pulpits across our nation that preach absolutely nothing. There you go. That preach absolutely nothing. There's no mention of hell. There's no mention of sin. God forbid if they talk about the cross. Amen. Amen. Right. They don't even want it in their sanctuaries because they don't want it to offend any Muslims that come in. They don't want it to offend any of the rest of the faiths that come in. Come on. Come on. So going to the pastor for counseling, and he counseled them all right. He talked them right out of their conviction and right back to the bottle. That's the kind of leaders we have in our churches today. That is the reason we see so much of the mess that we see today. Yeah. I told you this scripture a while ago, James 4 and 4. You don't have to go there because I'm only going to read you this one passage. Yeah. It says, Ye adulterers, adulterers and adulteresses, <laughs> know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend to the world is the enemy of God. But the church has became a friend to the world. The largest charismatic church, or evangelical church, however it is they want to word themselves, in the US, USA, there were interviews done from some of the people that go there. And I heard some of these myself. Some of these people were not even saved, didn't believe in Jesus, didn't believe exactly what the Bible teaches, but... The pastor's sermons were so motivational and so inspirational. They become so inspired to go out and accept Jesus. No, that's not what they said, Brother Dave. They become so inspired that they can go out and be the best that they can be. Positive thinking. With positive thinking, they can be the best that they can be. Don't, have, don't let any negative thoughts come into their mind. My Lord. That's the kind of stuff we've got preached in our pulpits. And those are things... That are enmity with God. To be a friend to the world. Yeah. To come down on the world's level. Mm. To bring them in. Mm. To not preach anything that will offend them. That is enmity with God. Amen. That is deciding to preach nothing in the book that offends anybody. Mm. It don't leave you very many scriptures to deal with. Amen. Very many scriptures to build on. That's why when they write their books, there's very little Scripture in their books. There's very little talk of Jesus in their books. Amen? One of the best-selling evangelical pastors in the United States, when they were asked about, you know, why the lack of Scripture? Why the lack of Jesus? Because he doesn't want it to be a preachy book. He wants it to just encourage people. Amen? 
My goodness, I don't want to encourage you right into hell today, amen? I don't want you to hate me, but I'm not going to stand before God one of these days and give an account yeah. on why. See, when you stand before God and God judges you, right. I want you to remember that Brother Billy tried to tell me this. Exactly. Somebody warned me. Absolutely. I don't want you to stand there, point your finger and say, why didn't you ever tell me this? Yeah. Amen. Why didn't you ever preach this? But that's the kind of preachers we need today. Old-fashioned, Holy Ghost-filled preachers that will preach the truth. You know what Charles Spurgeon said? This is a quote from Charles Spurgeon, one of the great preachers of our day. If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead body. If they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, begging them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. Let it be filled in the teeth of our preaching. And let not one go unwarned or unprayed for before they reach that place. Amen. This was once the burden of the preacher today. Yes, true. This is the calling that when Jesus turned to His disciples... It said, go into all the world and preach the gospel Absolutely. to every creature. He wasn't talking about the prosperity gospel. Because the prosperity gospel is an enemy to the cross. Exactly. Amen. And these are the kind of preachers we used to have. These are the kind of preachers that people used to flock to. Come on. But not anymore. Come on, tell it. Today we, are see, we see a church world that is so in fear of offending anyone yeah. that they dare not stand and proclaim Jesus Christ and Him crucified as the only means of salvation that they dare not speak on the judgment. The judgment of hell. Come on. The fires of hell today. All right. Not all, but most of this is done in ignorance because we speak of them deceiving others. They themselves have been deceived. Right. Most of the preachers out there today have been deceived. Yes, sir. I don't believe that all of them get up this morning and thought, I'm going to go deceive these people. Mm -hmm. No, I believe most of them got up and thought, I'm going to go out there and encourage them. Right. I'm, going to make, I'm going to really help them. Huh. They really think they're helping them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope they wake up before it's too late to figure out they didn't help them. Amen. They didn't help them. When these modern day Dr. Feelgood preachers, motivational speakers, are asked about hell, which is the judgment that you will suffer if you neglect the message of this book, Amen. the reply is this, you know, I don't go there. That's not my calling. To that I reply, if that's not your calling, you're in the wrong business. Amen. Amen. Quit calling yourself a preacher. Exactly. Quit calling yourself a pastor. Absolutely. Slap some name on you like Dr. Phil has. Amen. Amen. True. Because you're not a preacher. Exactly. If you're a preacher, that is your calling. Amen. Do we preach on sin and hell every sermon? No. We don't do that here. But whenever you look at their sermon index, you see something large speaks out to you. There's no sermons on hell. No sermons on sin. Come on. The complete absence of these sermons speak much louder than all the other sermons that you have. Amen. When asked about hell, Dr. Feelgood says, I don't go there. Mm. When asked about homosexuality, Dr. Feelgood says, I don't go there. Mm. When asked about abortion, Dr. Feelgood says, I don't go there. My when asked of hell, he smiled and said, I don't go there. That's not my calling. Lord help me. To that I reply, <clears throat> you stand before 40,000 people every week, mm. millions around the world, yeah. and you never ever speak on hell. Mm. You may not go there now, but if you continue on the path that you're going, you will go there one day. Amen. It's a sad statement to make. Yes. When asked about all of these things, and these are not some, you know, I can understand if they, if it's some kind of a thing that's not, uh, not, not relevant in our society today, but the things that I've mentioned to you are the most relevant topics there is today that's coming against the body of Christ and the structure of the home. All right. 
Right. Never speak on any of these things. Bob Anderson was asked this question. Why the lack of preaching on sin or hell? He replied this. When you have a group of people who are born again that are not going to hell, why talk about it? Why talk about it? I'll give you three reasons today out of many why we must talk about it. Now again, I'm not saying we have to preach this every Sunday. But some of these preachers don't ever, ever, never, you'll find no sermon at all. One man took over, was voted in as pastor of a Presbyterian church here in the United States. And this church had kept up with the sermons each week that the pastors had preached over the umpteen years. And he said as he sat in his office and he went back through all of the sermons, his heart began to be grieved. Not because they were bad sermons. Yeah. Because he didn't find one sermon. Come on. All the pastors said had. He didn't find one sermon about hell. Come on, brother. Not one sermon about hell. Rick Warren today wow. says that hell is something that helps drive his ministry. That's one of the burdens of his heart. If you check his store, if you look at his sermon index, you will not find a sermon on hell. Joel Osteen says he wants to help you. Yeah. He has not one pamphlet, not one flyer, not one book, not one sermon, not one tape, not one CD, not one video on hell. Never preached a message on hell. Mm. Oh. I don't mean to single out your favorite preacher today, but those are some of the most popular and some of the ones that have become the poster boys yeah. for the feel-good, seeker-friendly movement that we have today. Why should we preach on hell? Number one. How do you know that everyone in your pew is saved? Amen? Come on. It's dangerous today for you to assume if you've got a full house. I'm talking about if you've got very many people. Right. It's dangerous for you today to assume that everyone in that church is saved. True. Brother Bill said he gave the altar call one morning. I don't remember where he was preaching now. I've been Harvest Vision back when he was helping out there. But there was somebody that was there and they came every Sunday. He gave the altar call and that person came up. Said they wanted to be saved. But the people had assumed the whole time that they were saved. Right. It's dangerous for us to assume that there's some you know that are saved. Amen. The Bible says by their fruits you will know them. Right. Your spirit and their spirit. Right. You know that they're saved. They're born again. Come on. But it's dangerous today. That's why you need to preach on hell. Amen. Number two, what about the lost that come in? Or as we have our media church here, that tune in. What about the lost that are not saved? That tune in. Or they go to your website. Or they go to your bookstore. Or they look through your catalog and never see an offering of a sermon on sin or hell. Come on, brother. Number three, what about this one? Another reason we need to preach on hell is because the church doesn't need to forget. The church doesn't need to forget that there is a hell. Amen? Amen. The church doesn't need to forget that there is a place of torment for those that do not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Amen. The church doesn't need to forget, but that's what we have today. Yeah. A church that has forgot. Today we have a bunch of brainwashed people in our churches that have drank so much of the Kool-Aid that these preachers have to offer that they no longer know the truth and furthermore, they don't want to hear the truth. Amen? Amen. That's right. Two weeks ago, I found myself having to defend a statement I made. That's good preaching there. Whenever I said it, the next time that you want to, the next time you decide to, to pray to Mary or any of the other dead saints, mm -hmm. go outside and spit in the wind because it's going to accomplish as much as your prayer to Mary. All right. And I found myself having to, to defend praying to Mary to a Christian. My Lord. Supposedly a minister. My. Let God judge them. I said, What? and sit by in silence as they split hell wide open, praying to Mary goes to the very foundation of our faith. Right. It, is a, it is an attack to the very foundation of our faith. The Bible says plainly, there is only one mediator between God and man. And that is not Mary. That is not St. Andrew. That is not St. Peter. That is not St. Paul. The mediator between God and man, the only one that stands between us and getting our petition to God is Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen? And I begin to get feedback from not the sinner, 
I never heard one word from the sinner. Yeah. But the minister, oh, now wait a minute, brother. Oh, if they're in false doctrine, God will take care of that. How? If His people sit by on their hands with their mouth shut and let people die and go to a devil's hell because they're afraid they will offend somebody. Oh, great. When you speak out on homosexuality, when you speak out on sin and indulging in it, the, the feedback you get from today's churches, judge not. Don't judge. Come on, God's my judge. Yes. Yeah, He's mine too. And one day I will give an account whether I preached the truth yes. or whether I preached false doctrine. Amen. Whether I preached to you the truth or if I wanted you to feel good. Mm -hmm. See, most preachers aren't interested in you as much as they are filling their pew. Amen. Well, Most preach it takes more love. Right. Yeah. It takes more love Amen. to preach you the truth yeah, than it does to preach you what you want to hear. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Truth. Exactly. And we that, that's the kind of preachers we used to have. Absolutely. More of. Absolutely. Amen. We used to have more of those. Right. But we are seeing the result of those preachers in our pews. Right. That's where the feedback comes from of it. Don't judge people. God will take care of that. You're being judgmental. It's not our place to speak out on that. Yeah. Where that comes from is the Kool-Aid they've been drinking from these funky preachers that stand behind the pulpit and preach to them something that's watered down, diluted. Mm -hmm. They might open up with a little scripture of, you know, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Yeah. And then the rest of their sermon is little jokes and little stories inspiring you to be the best that you can be. I'm pretty sure whenever you get to hell, you're not going to think, man, I wish somebody would have told me what a better person I could have been in the other life. I wish somebody would have told me what kind of a success I could have had in the other life. No, they're going to be saying, I wish somebody had told me about this awful place. I wish somebody would have told me that Jesus Christ was the only way. Come on. Come on, preach. Enemies of the cross. Yes. Enemies of the cross. Absolutely. The prosperity gospel today is an enemy of the cross. Why? Because it takes the eyes off of Jesus and puts your eyes on materialism. Right. Puts your eyes on other things. Come on. It takes your eyes off of Jesus and puts your eyes on other things. Amen. The word of faith gospel as we know it today is not the message of the Bible. Let me go back for just a minute since y'all ain't in a hurry. The prosperity gospel. There is a prosperity to be found in God. I'm not completely doing away with it. Right. But... Not to the extreme that it's being preached today. Amen. I have read quotes from preachers. I have heard with my own ears, preachers, yeah. if you're poor, you're not in the will of God. Mm. If you're not being blessed financially, you're not in the will of God. Mm. <clears throat> that is not Bible. Amen. Not one of the disciples were rich. Right. They followed Jesus. True. Not one of the apostles were rich. Amen. They followed Jesus. Paul had a little bit of money. He gave all that up whenever he followed, started to follow Jesus. Right. The rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, what must I do to be born again? Jesus said, get rid of all your stuff. Right. Follow me. Follow me. Amen. Can't follow me with all that luggage. You know why he told him that? Because he knew the young man's heart. Amen. There's no sin in being rich. You're not closer to God if you're poor. Right. You're not closer to God if you're rich. Yeah. Amen. Amen. One thing has nothing to do with the other. Right. But Jesus knew the young man's heart. He knew that his God was his money. Right. He knew that his God was his money. And he said, if you'll sell everything you got, take up your cross and follow me. Right. And the young man went away sad because he wanted God, but he also wanted the God of money. Come on. God is jealous. Brother least he will not share the throne with anybody or anything else right. in your life. Amen. True. He will not share that. He said he is a jealous, jealous God. God. Amen. He don't want you to worship no other God besides Him. He, he demands complete worship. He does not want you. That's why you feel convicted over your shiny boat that you wax every Sunday when you ought to be in church. Amen? Anything wrong with you having a boat? No, but you've took it a little bit farther than that. Right. Amen? People worshiping materialism. Right. Yeah. People worshiping materialism. Yeah. Right. The things of the world. Right. That's why the prosperity gospel as we know it today is an enemy to the cross. The word of faith gospel is not the message of the Bible. It is a tool of the devil. Come on. It is an enemy of the cross because it takes the focus off of Jesus and His Word yeah. and puts the focus on man and His Word. Yeah. Even to the place of calling man a little God. 
A little God. I really don't think that some people know what some of these preachers preach. If they knew that that's what Kenneth Hagin preached, if they knew that that's what Kenneth Copeland preached, if they knew that that's what Joyce Meyer preached, if they knew that that's what all these other ministers that have went along those lines, Joseph Prince, he seems to be one on the rise today. Amen? Anytime there's a preacher gaining great significance with the church world, I always go look at their doctrine because I know something ain't right. Amen? Amen? There is no such thing as mother grace. That's a term he uses. That's a Catholic term. Right. Amen? True. No such thing as mother grace. There's no such thing as once saved, always saved. Not unconditionally. Amen? We must keep our faith. You can be saved once and always saved, but you must keep your faith in Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Amen? When we begin to put our faith in other things, we will lose out with God. Other things that are enemies of the cross. The Word of Faith Gospel today, the way we see it preached. But really, Brother Billy, there's truth in that. There's always a little bit of truth in what the devil uses. He always sprinkles a little bit of truth in that. Just enough to make you think that this is okay. This is alright. So the prosperity gospel, enemy of the cross. The Word of Faith Gospel, enemy of the cross. The power of positive thinking or the psychology gospel that has crept into the church is not the message of the Bible. It is a tool of the devil and is an enemy of the cross because it takes the focus off of Jesus and puts the focus once again on man, his own power, his own thoughts. And the Bible's already told us that our thoughts are not his thoughts. Our ways are not his ways. He has exalted his word above ours. I'm sorry, but he has exalted his word and his thoughts Amen. above ours. Amen. Yeah. What do you think happened at the Tower of Babel? We'll build us a tower big enough to reach to the heavens. Yeah. And God sent confusion. They all looked at each other and started saying, And the other scratched his head and they got so confused they had to spread out all over the place. Because they tried to get to God. What do you think brought Lucifer down? I will ascend above the most high. Amen? You ain't the first person that had the little God doctrine. Lucifer himself birthed that. Amen? I will ascend above God. I will be like Him. I will ascend above His throne. Amen. That's good. Enemies of the cross. Good preaching. Enemies of the cross. Amen. Listen to me. A message that only speaks of a heaven to gain and neglects to preach and to warn of the danger of sin and the fires of hell to shun is not the message of the Bible. Amen. Jesus Himself spoke on hell. Oh, come on. He gives the most vivid story and account, historical account, because it happened. It was not a, it was not a parable. He gives the name of the beggar, Lazarus. Mm. He gives a vivid account of what hell is like. Right. Amen. Come on. A message without that in it. Somewhere. I, like I said, I know you can't preach it every Sunday. We're not talking about that. We're talking about the complete absence of it completely from ministries today. Right. No preaching on sin. No preaching on hell. Mm. This is why Paul said if someone else comes preaching another gospel, it would be accursed. Yeah. Because that message is an enemy of the cross. These are some famous quotes. These are some quotes from, from, from famous preachers when asked if Christ was the only way. One of the preachers said, I have seen the hearts of those who practice Hinduism, and I know their heart was sincere. Let God judge them, I can't. God has already judged them. Amen. The judgment of their faith has already been judged. Right. We have this book today. They'd be like me getting up and saying, somebody can go, they can go 80 if they want to. Who am I to judge them? <clears throat> what if the judge sat up there and he said, going 80 and 55? Ain't my place. You know, that's between him and God. No, it's already rolled as a law in the book. All right. Jesus Christ Himself already established the fact that there's only one way to get to God. True. So whenever we say that other faiths do not lead to God, when we say that other gods do not lead to God, Amen. We're simply repeating what Jesus Christ Himself said. Right. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Amen. I've heard other preachers say, another man say this right here, if those who don't know Jesus, but they turn to whatever light they think is God, then mm. I believe God will accept that. Mm. That pretty much includes everybody, don't it? Yeah. The gospel of inclusion. Nobody's going to go to hell. Let me ask you this, then why does hell have to keep getting bigger? Right. 
Another person, not a preacher, but a popular person. There can't be just one way. There are many ways that lead to God. Sure, Jesus is one of the ways. Huh, that ain't what Jesus said. Jesus Himself warned of sin and warned of hell. He warned of hell in a vividly graphic manner whenever He speaks of the rich man going to hell. And I want to close with this today. I wouldn't come up just yet, Brother Rod. Luke, the 16th chapter in the 19th verse. Why preach on hell? Why mention it? Brother Sleece is saved. Brother David's saved. Brother Rodney's saved. Everybody in here this morning, I would testify to, I believe you're saved. But why talk about hell around here? Because we don't need to forget that there is a hell. Amen. The more we realize there's a hell, the more of a burden we'll have for those that are going there. Right. When we lose sight of the fact that there's a hell, no sense of warning on sin. We become complacent with the th way the things are here in this world. I'm only hearing about heaven because that's all you hear about on TV is that heaven, no hell. Amen? Mom. When they knock on your door, well, they tell you they ain't hell. Amen? When you turn on the TV, they never mention hell. One famous, probably the most famous evangelist that America has ever known said he's not sure anymore. This Hopefully he's changing my mind now. At one time he said, I'm not sure anymore that hell is actually literal. Mm. I believe that it's more of a separation from God than it is a place of flames. Mm. Well, let me clear that up this morning Amen. with the words of another preacher that holds a little bit more authority than you do, than I do. Luke 16 and 21 Luke 16 and 19, I'm sorry. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Now remember that. Jesus put this in there for a reason because the people he's speaking to equated worldly gain with godliness. Think about that. They believed that if you were poor, you were not in right standing with God. They believed that if you were being blessed financially, then you must have found favor in God's sight. Mm -hmm. So it's important today that Jesus puts this in there and says there was a certain rich man that was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. They could relate to that. So the first thought in their mind is going to be that that rich man was a godly man. It's the way some of the stupid prosperity gospel preaches today. Amen? Amen. You're prospering. You must be right with God. One false teacher said, well, you can look at how much money my ministry has coming in and all the places I'm going to, the crowds that I'm drawing, that I must be preaching the truth. <laughs> Man has some kind of simple idea that well, there's a crowd going, must be good. Yeah. I like what Brother Slee said this morning. The crowd on that day in front of Pilate, they weren't going the right way. They wasn't good, but they had the majority that day. Yeah. Majority ruled. Yeah. Just because you got a big crowd don't mean you're doing right. Amen. Matter of fact, sadly, most of the time it means you ain't in the world that we live in. Right. So he says there was this rich man, he was, he was clothed in some great duds. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. Now this man was broke, tired, and sick, Brother Dave. Now what do you think that those people he was talking to thought about this beggar? They would automatically assume that this beggar is not a godly man. He's been cursed. That's why they could walk by with their self-righteous indignation and all of that. They could walk by the beggar at the gate beautiful yeah. and look down their nose on him because he must be cursed of God. Who sinned? Him or his mama? That's what they asked the time that they came to Jesus wanting to know about this, this man that was healed. Who sinned? Him or his mama? His daddy? His parents? Somebody sinned that had to bring this judgment on him. Sometimes good people just go through bad things. Amen? Right. People that have their faith in God. I watched Mrs. Johnson, our grade school teacher, shrivel away to nothing and die of cancer. Wasn't because she wasn't a woman of faith. She was. Yeah. She was a woman of faith. Right. Bad things happen to good people. Amen. I don't want you to know something else Jesus did here. And don't you think that they didn't pick it every little word he said? They're standing there thinking, now why didn't he give us the rich man's name? Jesus wanted them to know that being rich and faring sumptuously in fine linen and clothing every day 
didn't rank very high on God's poll of righteousness. All right. He didn't even mention the rich man's name. There was a certain beggar, his name was Lazarus. Mm -hmm. He desired to be fed the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. Now they're really thinking, man, I, that guy was really cursed. And it came to pass that the beggar died. So they're with him so far. And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now this will make them question their doctrine a little bit. If he was holy enough or righteous enough to be carried into Abraham's bosom, if he was right with God, then why wouldn't, didn't he have a better life down here? Always get to the rich man next. Listen. The rich man also died and was buried. Surely they both went to the same place, but, Ab but this, uh, this rich man will get more reward from Abraham. The next thing he says about the rich man is in hell he lift up his eyes. Being in torments, seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, this could not have just been the grave that they buried him in. Because Jesus specifically says that in hell he lifted up his eyes and seeth Abraham afar off yeah. and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Amen. That's pretty plain that there is a fire in hell. Amen? Yes. Yes, sir. I don't like it. I wish it wasn't real. Come on. But it is. Yes. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things and Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Come on. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. Yeah. So that which would pass from thence, from hence to you, to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. All right. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, talking to Abraham, uh -huh. that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For what purpose, church? To preach. All right. Send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren yeah. that he may testify or preach unto them. Preach unto them about what? Go and tell them about their best life now. Mm -hmm. Go and preach to them about prosperity. Mm -hmm. Go and preach to them. No, because his brothers were wrapped up in the same thing he was. They think they're okay because they got some money. Yeah. They think they're okay because they're being blessed with some materialism. Right. He didn't ask Abraham to send somebody to preach the word of faith doctrine. He didn't ask somebody to go and preach to them the prosperity gospel. He didn't ask somebody to go preach to them the power of positive thinking. He asked for him to send somebody to warn them about the fires of hell so that they wouldn't come to this awful place. Amen. Go and tell my brothers I got five of them. I don't want them to come to this awful place that I'm in. Oh my, I have five brethren that he may testify, preach to them. Yeah. Lest they also come into this place of torment. He didn't say go tell them soft, soothing words. Don't go tell them, don't go make them feel better about the place that they're at. Go preach some Holy Ghost conviction that'll make them feel so bad. They gotta find a place to get on their knees and cry out for forgiveness and repent so that they don't come to this awful place. The people that filled your building this morning don't need to feel good about sin. They don't need to forget about hell. They, remain, they need to be reminded that sin will still cost you more than you want to pay. Take you farther than you want to go and leave you and keep you longer than you want to stay. They need to be reminded today that there is a hell that is a judgment for all those who do not put their faith in the only way. Jesus Christ in Him crucified. They need to be reminded. And he wanted him to send somebody. You see, the church of today don't want to hear this kind of preaching. Right. Those in hell are begging for God to send somebody Amen. to preach to them this kind of preaching. Amen. I'm trying to hurry. <clears throat> my, 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 I have five brethren. See, you're going to have memory whether you're in heaven or whether you're in hell. Right. You're going to remember. 
He said, send somebody to testify to them. Don't let them come to this awful place. Come on. Send somebody to preach to them. They tried to preach to me while I was there, and I didn't listen. This is where it got me. Mm -hmm. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Yeah. The rich man said, no, nay, Father Abraham. But if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Mm -hmm. they, will, they will repent and do right then if somebody went to them from the dead. Do you know what they tried to do with Lazarus after Jesus raised him from the dead? Kill him. Mm. Jesus had already brought one man back from the dead and all, a bunch of them seen it. Mm -hmm. And the noise of it went abroad. And Abraham said, that's already been done. They didn't listen. They've got Abraham. They've got the prophets. They've got the writings. Mm -hmm. Let them hear them. Let them hear them. Listen to what the rich man said. He said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one is sent, it went unto them from the dead, they will repent. It was a message of repentance that he wanted Abraham to send. See, once you get to hell, you'll know why you're there. You won't scratch your head and wonder, why did I come here? Mm. You'll know. It was because you did not repent and put your faith in the only way that God has made for man to escape this judgment. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How shall they escape? How shall they escape the judgment to come without a preacher to tell them Amen. of the judgment to come? The rich man begged Abraham to send somebody to tell him. Right. Send somebody to warn him. Mm -hmm. When you stood before your 40,000 this morning and your millions, and they sat there and they amen in and soaked up every few good message you had to give them, mm -hmm. countless souls in hell begging you to tell them mm -hmm. about hell. Mm -hmm. Amen. Begging you to tell them. If you could hear their voices today, their voices would not be, oh, come on, tell them something to make them feel good. Yeah. Tell them something about prosperity because see them fine clothes that he was in? Mm. He left them here on this earth. Amen. Those riches that he had, he left them here on this earth. Right. They had no significance whatsoever to him in eternity. Amen. Go tell them about hell. Amen. Go tell them about sin. Yes. Go tell them to repent. Go tell them there is only one way. All of the topics that the popular preachers of today avoid speaking on are the very things that those that are in hell are begging you to preach. Mm -hmm. All right. All of them. Not just those in hell, but the Father in heaven. That's the message He wants you to preach. Yes. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how can a preacher do them any good without the right message? Amen. Amen. True. How shall we escape? If we turn to the enemies of the cross for our salvation today, we won't escape. Amen. Someone else this morning have something before we go.